to join us. They can uh, watch the recording later. And I'm going to wait one more minute and I'm going to kickstart, but I want to appreciate everyone for joining today and especially Lawrence for joining us all the way from the West Coast somewhere. And I don't know exactly where. <laughs> I'm in the Seattle area. Seattle area. Good. Awesome. Thank you. Happy fourth weekend to everybody. Bye. Can everybody see my screen? Mm, not yet. Yes. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. Perfect. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's start then. Welcome, everyone. This is our sixth presentation, our eleventh, I think, session with Deep Learning Adventures. We are learning group um, that. Uh, as a community, we've been taking uh, this specialization from Coursera called TensorFlow in Practice. And today we have the special honor of having the, the lead and actually the developer of the specialization, Lawrence, joining us all the way from Seattle and having a chat with us, um, getting to hear some of our feedback, some lessons learned, and uh, where do we, how can we use this knowledge learned and how can we use it in our day-to-day -day jobs or, or hobbies. So with that said, if this is the first time you hear about us, uh, we, you can find us on, on Meetup, you can join us on Slack. Um, if you haven't been able to join any of our previous sessions, they are all recorded and available on, on YouTube on this bit.ly Deep Learning TF. Um, so I encourage you to check it out. I just want to quickly thank some of the other Meetups that have uh, helped us in the past or have helped us today with cross posting this event. Um, I think the Deep Learning Working Group, many of our members are actually uh, part of this uh, meetup that we went there and we met there and we, uh, uh, we went through the specialization by Andrew. That's how we started this whole effort. You know about Deep Learning, which we covered a little bit on PyTorch for the last uh, six months before this outbreak started. Um, the Machine Learning Paper Club, which is focused more and more of reading papers and trying to understand more on the academic side of new, new developments uh, on the deep learning world. And last session, we talked about the, the transformer papers, the data uh, uh, Facebook paper that uses transformers to actually uh, detect objects in an image recognition setup. I also want to thank the, the Bethesda Artificial Intelligence Meetup. These are all Washington, DC, Virginia, Maryland Meetup uh, related uh, in the area. So. A very interesting meetup as well, very active. We, we meet um, bi-weekly on, on Saturday mornings and I want to thank them for hosting this event. Um, George, George, will you have links to all these on the meetup event page? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Yep. These and slides will be posted on the meetup page as well. Yep, they're already there. Yep. And also Upskill ML and Data Education DC, two other meetups that uh, we hope to collaborate more in the future. Um, Upskill ML is more of a um, hands-on approach where you, um, more of a, like a bootcamp where you actually uh, learn something on the weekend and uh, you, live, uh, you live the meetup with practical knowledge on how to apply AI topics. And lastly but not least, Neurotech. Uh, X, which has multiple chapters worldwide and different events. Uh, they're focused more on the neuroscience part of, of, of AI or just neuroscience. And uh, we want to thank them for uh, cross posting this event as well. Cool. Uh, we usually get to know our community better, but given the large amount of users we have today, that unfortunately won't be possible. So um, just to give an idea, uh, we usually say a few words about ourselves and what do we find interesting and how do we, uh, what do we plan to learn in the next, uh, you know, couple of weeks or so? We also have to keep this engaging. We have um, our online deep learning trivia games and we have links to them on our meta pages. I highly recommend you that you check them out. Um, we have created one for each course of this specialization and you can, um, you can test your knowledge, you can have fun, you can refresh your memory. It's, it's a very good and engaging way to, to learn new concepts that we found. And I want to make sure that uh, we pay attribution to Coursera and Deep Learning AI. A lot of the great content that we've used in the past uh, have come from there. And I, I want to make sure that uh, 
they're acknowledged. Great. Um, if you if this is your first time, then just a reminder that we're actually using the deep learning framework called TensorFlow, uh, which is an uh, uh, open source machine learning platform. Um, we've been using it to tackle image vision problems. We've been using it to tackle NLP problems, uh, time series problems, and so forth. And uh, we've been learning it more and more, and uh, we're happy to uh, to progress in our knowledge. And regarding the specialization, this Coursera specialization um, is a great place for you to start learning more about deep learning and AI and using this uh, TensorFlow. So this is a, um, they're essentially going through one of these AI courses. Yeah. So if you don't mind muting yourself, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. So the TensorFlow in practice is the, the first specialization that we took. There's a if you're already familiar with TensorFlow or deep learning, there's a more advanced version of it called data and deployment specialization that uh, we hope to hear more from Lawrence, more about the content and um, uh, some more information about it. It, it consists of four courses. And um, since we started early April, we covered them in detail. It starts with introduction to TensorFlow and AI. It covers convolutional neural networks, natural language processing, and sequences and time series. In terms of prerequisites, if you're brand new, um, uh, you need some programming in Python. Most of the programming exercises are in Python. And some high school uh, level math would be great, because you'll see that um, when we talk about gradient descent, or we talk a little bit about calculus or linear algebra, and matrices and vectors would be nice to know what those concepts mean. If, um, yeah, if, if you've taken a linear algebra calculus course or uh, something related to that, then you're in great shape. If you've heard of some basic deep learning concepts before, then, then you, that's even more helpful. And in terms of setup, we've been using this uh, uh, Colab, which is a free, uh, think of it as a free Jupyter notebook hosted on Google Cloud. Uh, you can use a CPU, you can use a GPU, you can even, even use a TPU for I think about 12 hours and you can run your deep learning models there. Great. Without further ado, I'd like to uh, also introduce my two co-organizers, Robert and David, and um, also welcome our uh, guest speaker today, Lawrence, and once again, thank you for, for being here with us and just, um, just saying, just hearing back from him, uh, what has been his experience so far with with TensorFlow in practice, and uh, we can start with the first bullet point of well, what, what were your goals, Lawrence, when you started the specialization, or some challenges that you faced, and how you overcame them. Yeah, that, that's a good question, and I could spend the whole hour talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I, I'm I'm playing with new AirPods um, for this conference, and AirPods don't seem to fit my ears properly, and they keep falling out. So if my audio drops out, I'm not being rude. It's just my AirPods fell out again. And yeah. AirPods are so smart that when you take them out, they stop working. But when they fall out, they also stop working. So uh, we, we, we need to work on the model for them a little bit. But anyway, uh, so the goals and challenges uh, developing the course. Um, I think the, the vision originally behind the course was um, I read a survey. Um, performed by a Chinese company, and they counted the number of AI practitioners in the world. And they counted it at 300,000. And um, I, was, I was a little surprised by that, uh, to be frank, um, because I thought the number would be much greater. Uh, so I started trying to figure out, well, how do I count the number of AI practitioners in the world? And the methodology that they used was really the only one that they could, and that was the number of people who have their name on a paper. And so it was around 300,000. Um, but then when you look at the number of software developers in the world, um, it, obviously there's varying figures. Um, I've seen, you know, it usually lands in right around the 30 million number. And like last week, Apple had WWDC, and I think Tim Cook said there were 26 million iOS developers alone. Uh, so 30 million is probably a bit conservative. Uh, so I realized that in order to avoid another AI winter, we really needed to have a lot more than 300,000 people practicing AI and building AI and machine learning stuff. 
And so an important part of that would be to um, train as many as possible. And so part of the way to entry, unfortunately, is that AI and ML was generally seen as a highly academic thing. Uh, you needed to know advanced calculus, you needed to know probability and statistics. And, you know, it was being kind of confused with the discipline of machine learning. Uh, so we're like, well, a few couple of years ago, we released TensorFlow at Google, and we're like, the idea behind TensorFlow was open source and make it easy and make it accessible for people to be able to build ML and AI solutions. And at this time, TensorFlow 1 was in the wild, and I, we were working on TensorFlow 2, and TensorFlow 2, the idea was to make it much more developer-friendly, uh, much higher level API, Keras being a first-class citizen, eager by default so that you write a line of code, that line of code executes instead of hundreds of lines of code being loaded into a graph and then the graph executes. And you know, it, it, the kind of things that this was really anathema to developers. So uh, I knew that this was coming. And so I um, reached out to Andrew and cause I had learned from Andrew um, with his deep learning specialization and his Stanford classes and basically said the same thing to him that I just said to you. And it was like, and, and definitely, you know, the main part was really to make sure that we don't want another AI winter. We don't want this to be a massive explosion of papers and then nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in order to do that, we really need software developers on board. So I wanted to develop, combined with the fact that I knew coming down the pipe from Google and it would be released like uh, in the spring of last year, TensorFlow 2 was going to be released. So this was about three, four months before that. I knew this was coming down the pipe. I knew that, you know, there was a need to get developers on board. So um, I pitched the idea of uh, TensorFlow in practice that's designed to complement his uh, deep learning specialization. So like all of the theory, how convolutions work, how neurons work, how RNNs and all that work and all the math behind them, he had already taught and nobody can do it better. Um, but then it was like getting that and putting that into practice with free open source software. That's what I wanted to do. And so he was like, sign me up, <laughs> you know, let's get started. And that was really the goal behind it. That's how we got started with doing it. Um, the challenges behind that is um, in a similar vein. It's a lot of people in some ways who are so invested in the mathematical side of deep learning um, didn't really like the idea of, this person doesn't know calculus, you should not trust them to build a model. And you know they don't know how a convolution works, you should not trust them to build a CNN. And so there, there was some barriers uh, to that and some challenges in internal and external. And I think that was the biggest one. And then even after we launched it, um, having people take it seriously um, without like, you know, hey, I'm not writing a lot of Greek letters on every slide, <laughs> you know, and it's like, a, have people take it seriously without that was, was definitely a challenge. But, Thankfully, we've, we've overcome that challenge. And then there was one last part um, of the puzzle was to then have a certificate program associated with this. Um, I used to work at Microsoft many years ago. And one of the things that helped me in my career to move from a junior developer to become much more senior and eventually join Microsoft is that they, they had these uh, MCPs, the Microsoft Certified Professional Program. And it was like, I realized we need like a certified developer program um, for AI. And so, you know, the, the goal was to come up with a TensorFlow certified developer program. And it's very much a developer program as opposed to a practitioner, an AI, uh, sorry, a researcher or anything along those lines. So it was like, what was the core uh, the technologies that somebody would have to learn uh, to be employable um, as a, somebody who builds models? So we kind of did the research around that. It was like computer vision was clearly the number one. Uh, number two was then um, natural language processing. And then number three, to some extent, was uh, sequence modeling. So we said, okay, when we develop this course, we're going to develop something that teaches developers how to be able to be proficient in these, maybe not deep expertise in them, but proficient in them, and then use that to drive a certificate program. And then the certificate launched like last October. So that's, that's the short version of a very long story, but uh, that, that was really the idea behind TensorFlow in practice. Fascinating, yeah, and I appreciate you sharing that with us because I remember when, you, when the, the specialization starts, you talk with Andrew about the, the gap between AI developers and software developers and how you, how you, yeah. you hope to bridge that gap. Really interesting. Yeah, exactly. And it's, you know, my vision was that of the 30 million software developers, 
if we can make 10% of them AI developers, that would be 3 million, and that would be 10x the number of AI practitioners that were counted by the research that I mentioned before. And one of the things that Larry Page, one of the founders of Google, whenever we try to do something, um, he would always be, how do you 10x? How do you 10x? So ahead of time, when I started pitching this, I didn't actually get to pitch it to Larry, unfortunately. Uh, but when uh, I was pitching and I got it as far as like Jeff Dean, and then Jeff was like, well, how do you 10x? And that, that's how I 10x. And uh, that, that's the target that we're heading towards. So it's, it's looking pretty good. Got it. Perfect. Thank you. And did Coursera and the, the remote setup of, of um, you know, the MOCC is basically, did that have anything to do with, with, with your decision or um, were you thinking uh, about platforms before Coursera? Yeah, so when we started this, the vision was always massively online. And this, of course, was before the pandemic. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to work with Udacity and Coursera and Udemy and, you know, others, um, particularly in different countries. There are, there are providers in different countries that also do MOOCs. So the idea was like, if we want to scale this, if you want to reach the 30 million software developers, we have to go the MOOC route. Uh, first and foremost. Uh, secondly, we didn't want it to be seen as a deep Google thing, like from Google to you, because then it's too easy for this to be confused with just marketing. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was like, you know, let's find folks who are visionaries and luminaries. And, you know, if they buy in and if they agree to the, with the vision and like, we're not making a penny out of this. The idea is for us not to make any money from it, but just to raise that boat of uh, folks who are learning AI and then work through them in partnership with them. So like Andrew runs deeplearning.ai. He was also one of the founders of Coursera. So then naturally it became like, you know, the outlet was through Coursera. Uh, we also did a similar course with uh, Sebastian Thrun in uh, Udacity. No, yeah, Udacity, sorry. Almost said Udemy. Sebastian would kill me. Uh, <laughs> also did a, uh, like a similar course through, oh, and one of my AirPods just fell out. And so, uh, and did a similar course like with Sebastian at um, uh, Udacity and then working like, for example, there were some large training partners in Asia uh, to like for Japanese language and Chinese language to do the same kind of thing. Great. Awesome. Very, very useful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, one thing that we were hoping to do with this meetup was to somehow uh, have a higher user engagement than just um, just meeting uh, every week. So basically the goal was to replicate as much as possible the close connection that we used to have when we used to meet in person, but due to this outbreak, we couldn't do anymore. Um, have you seen or have you attended any events that try to maximize this user engagement to us? Uh, I think that's the number one uh, goal. And we, we've been trying using, you know, we've been using our deep learning trivia games. We've been using like different happy hours, uh, informal sessions. So we're trying to keep it at a level that a, you feel welcome, but also you're also engaged with the community and you get to know each other better. Um, have you come across any other events or any other setups that try to culture this uh, that's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, most events that I've been doing uh, since lockdown and since working from home have been like Zoom like this and it's been hard to be engaging. Uh, but a couple that were pretty cool was when people kind of would uh, program and code live. And uh, so it's like if you're brave enough like to start teaching something and start coding live and then have a chat window open and you might be trying to use like, you know, a particular API and, you know, you, I don't know, you say import TensorFlow as TF and then you're doing, you know, I don't know, TF.KRS.Layers. You know, and then you and you might start typing GRU and somebody will say, no, an LSTM is better for this. And, you know, that, that kind of thing is like, I've, I've seen some people do that and it was really, really cool, but it, I think it was terrifying for the presenter, uh, but it was certainly much more uh, engaging uh, for the students and or for like people who were attending, sorry, not just students. And so that's one of the things that I've seen that's uh, very, very interesting and cool uh, in lockdown and to, to be a little bit better than just passively sitting and watching your screen and listening to people speak. Yeah. So I, I kind of like that. So anything where there's that kind of level of, I'm actually doing something from scratch, uh, help me. Um, even like you can open a Google Doc, right? Yeah. And you can invite people to that Google Doc and then people are in that Google Doc live with you 
and you can be typing something like maybe just typing out some pseudocode and they, they could like annotate it and, you know, make suggestions or even pop in a hyperlink to say, hey, look at this Stack Overflow question. This, this answers it better. And, and stuff like that I found is really, really interesting and cool. Awesome. Good. Good. But one thing I, I, I will... Yeah, one thing I'll call out that I thought was brilliant, though, was um, I don't know if you watched uh, WWDC uh, last week. And um, so the keynote at WWDC was one where they like they knew exactly that this is going to be passive. This is going to be uh, online and um, you're not going to have a speaker walking onto the stage talking about something, inviting other people onto the stage. These people walk on to applause. They, they just, and, and ended up being very, very snappy, very, very fast. And I mean, it was, I thought it was amazing. And then the amount of information that they were able to parlay like in 90 minutes was, you know, usually I've been a keynote writer at a number of different conferences and these things always go over time and <laughs> things always go wrong and you don't get to say everything you want to say because you run out of time and those kind of things were, I thought that was brilliant uh, what they did there. And I'm, I'm hoping others will, uh, will learn from that. And, I'm hoping we also learn from it as well as we're preparing future events. I just love to call that one out because I'm a fan. Awesome, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that ties up to the, the third bullet of other events and interesting cool events. Uh, I guess you kind of mentioned that, but yeah, um, that's very interesting, you know. Great. Um, Robert, David, uh, do you want to follow up with the next few points uh, with Lawrence? Robert, you want to ask the next question? Uh, sure. Yeah, so we were uh, interested in, in your thoughts on uh, the uh, TensorFlow PyTorch question. I know Torch has gotten a lot of users recently and wondering uh, where you see both of these tools going and what applications each is uh, stronger at. Uh, good question. Um, so be before I answer it, just to be clear, um, it's like one of the things like a, is a Google policy is that we don't really talk about competitive stuff. And we definitely don't talk about competitive stuff negatively. You know, other companies do that. And I think it's, it's a terrible thing when they do. So we, we don't want to follow that. But that being said, um, I'll also just like to comment that, first of all, I think it's brilliant that there are multiple frameworks out there. If I take off my Google hat for a second, you know, and if I were entering this field for the first time, and there was only one framework and it was being pushed by a particular vendor, I would say that I'd have to be pretty cynical that maybe there isn't something to that industry at all. And it's just one vendor trying to create a market for themselves. So by the fact that there are multiple frameworks, not just PyTorch and TensorFlow, um, there's lots of other stuff out there like, you know, uh, and I, I, so that, if I was not a Googler, was something that I'd find very encouraging. So to talk about the big two in particular, um, TensorFlow and Torch, um, one of the things that I see Torch is doing extremely well in is uh, academia and research. You know, we, we have to acknowledge that, like, you know, the, the number of papers that have been created using Torch are, you know, not zero, <laughs> not even close to zero. And um, so I'm kind of delighted that there are so many. I wish there were less of them and more TensorFlow, of course. Uh, but I think it's they're doing extremely well there. And we have a lot to learn from how Torch is architected that attracts researchers. And, you know, and as a result, it's like, you know, if we can learn from that and if we can help improve TensorFlow from those learnings, then I think it's a good thing. And vice versa, if they can learn from us and the things that we're doing to attract folks, um, then it becomes better for everybody. Where I'm more excited about TensorFlow is really more less on the research side and more on the in practice side and implementation side. And you know, we like to call TensorFlow not a framework anymore, it's really an ecosystem. And so the idea is like um, TensorFlow isn't just a framework for building models, but we have something called TFX, um, which allows you to build and run models in production and all of the attributes of running a model in production I don't know if you've ever seen the diagram, somebody published in a paper, but if you can imagine all of the systems to be able to put a machine learning model into production as like boxes, you know, things like model management, data management, pipelines, all of these kind of things. And the actual machine learning part of it is just a tiny little box in the middle. And it's easy for us to forget that. And so part of what we're trying to do with uh, TensorFlow as an ecosystem is support all of that as well. And then in addition to that is um, being able to deploy to pe where people will actually use it beyond enterprises, things like mobile. Um, so we have TensorFlow Lite, 
for iOS, for Android, and for embedded systems. Um, and we, we've TensorFlow serving that allows you to kind of put it on a web server. So like th those kind of things is really, you know, a huge, huge area that, again, if you want to avoid an AI winter, you have to have the ability to, you know, a, a, build industries and build businesses around machine learning and AI. And that's something that, that you know, I find we're doing really, really well. And we, I think we do better than anybody else. So Lawrence, that kind of leads into the next question we had, which, um, you know, TFX is this giant ecosystem with a lot of different parts. And some of them are addressed in the, that TensorFlow data and deployment uh, yep. specialization. But are there other ones that you have in mind for the future? I, a little birdie kind of told me there might be an advanced TensorFlow specialization down the road. Yep. Uh, so good question. And yes, there is an advanced uh, TensorFlow specialization. I'm working on it right now. Um, I don't know if you can see a whole bunch of camera equipment behind me here. Um, I can't film in Coursera anymore because I have to travel down to California to do that. So I've started, like I've set up a camera system here and I've, I'm filming it here with the hope that it'll be out probably towards the end of the summer or early autumn. Uh, so yes, that's advanced TensorFlow. But in addition to that, uh, we're also working on an ML engineering specialization. Uh, so my colleague, Robert Crow, um, I don't know if, you've, if you see the YouTube TensorFlow channel, uh, Robert tends to present about TFX. So he and Andrew are working on uh, this uh, machine learning engineering uh, specialization which will be a deep dive into TFX. Uh, so yeah, to help with that. So the, the, this, the goal is like four specializations. The first one, TensorFlow in practice, is really building models as we've discussed. Data and deployment is then taking that and trying to put it into the real world in a basic way. So here's how to build a basic Android, iOS app, embedded systems, web server, those kind of things. <clears throat> and then my advanced specialization will be going into more advanced scenarios around computer vision and those kind of things. And then Robert's specialization will be all about like um, building machine learning engineering, building it like for enterprises and those kind of things. Okay. So for this data and deployment, is the emphasis on other programming language apart from Python and uh, Lawrence, like JavaScript or, or Java or yeah. Swift for, for mobile yeah. devices? So so, so where necessary it is, yeah. So there's four courses. One of them is an introduction to TensorFlow.js. So you spend a lot of time in JavaScript. Uh, one of them is an introduction to TensorFlow Lite. So there, you spend some time in Python building models and converting them to TensorFlow Lite. But then you jump out of Python and into Kotlin uh, to build on Android and into Swift to build on iOS. Uh, and then the other two courses, one of them is on TensorFlow Serving. That's all Python. And then the other one is really on like more advanced deployment scenarios where we talk about things like federated learning and that kind of stuff. So yes, you will go into those other languages. Not to be confused by, with Swift for TensorFlow, because I see uh, Viraf has asked that question in the chat window. Yeah. Uh, Swift for TensorFlow shouldn't be seen as iOS Swift, um, which is for building iOS and iPad OS and uh, iMac OS. Is it called iMac OS or just Mac OS? It's Mac OS uh, applications. Swift for TensorFlow is actually for building models. Um, so it should be seen as a parallel uh, to Python for TensorFlow. Got it. So yeah, there was another question on TF Lite and Edge devices. Would data and deployment be the closest specialization related to that then? Yes, exactly. Uh, okay. So yes, uh, Stephen Milligan asked this one. Uh, that's exactly the idea behind data and deployment. Um, that there's a specialization around that. Like I said, there's four courses in it. One is TensorFlow.js, so you learn how to train and run inference in the browser. One of them is TensorFlow Lite, where you do deployment to iOS, um, Android, and embedded systems. One is on TensorFlow Serving, where you serve it via the web. And then one is on what we call advanced deployment scenarios, where we talk a little bit about TFX, about federated learning, and stuff like that. Got it. Awesome. Thank you, Lawrence. One more topic that I wanted to ask you about was the TensorFlow developer exam. Um, I know that it was shaped around the TensorFlow in practice specialization. Um, uh, some of us have taken it and passed it recently, and I just wanted to pick your brain regarding the uh, requirement of using PyCharm versus Colab. The, during the entire TensorFlow in practice, you're actually using Colab, which is very user-friendly, very easy for you to use from any computer. Um, I don't have a GPU on my home station, so I actually to use a, a, a Google Cloud Compute Engine 
I had to use uh, PyCharm there using the UI, which you, I think was using like a Debian 9 UI, very old school UI. <laughs> and it was more of a, the longest time it took me was to actually set up the VM and take the exam versus spending time on the content and answering questions. I was just curious about that. Yeah, um, the mechanics of yeah. running an exam yeah. and preventing people from cheating, uh, delivering template code to them that they write and test and then deliver for submission, it just wasn't possible with Colab. Uh, I mean, Colab is a great environment for all that kind of stuff. It's just not a great environment for exams. And so it had to be some kind of local installation. Um, and uh, we've done a lot of exams before, for example, with Android, with Android Studio. And so we had all of that infrastructure in place already. Uh, my recommendation that I give to people um, is that um, obviously to get your PyCharm environment set up and working and everything already before you begin uh, the exam. But there's no reason why you can't prototype your code in Colab, particularly if you don't have a GPU. Um, so sometimes like one of the questions, there's a question around the horses and humans data set, which I found is the one that takes the longest to train. So if you're uh, unlucky enough to get that question in the CNN section, um, you know, that, that one takes the longest to train, but there's no reason why you couldn't like pop into Colab, set up a GPU in Colab, write your code, train, get a working model, uh, know that it's all working, and then take your code and drop it into PyCharm and then execute it in PyCharm while you move on to the next question. And uh, you know, that, that's a handy little shortcut, uh, particularly if you have an underpowered uh, machine. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, just when it comes to the the concept of being able to administer an exam, uh, we had to do something on local like that. And if it was too easy to cheat an exam, then the certificate wouldn't have any meaning whatsoever. My screensaver just kicked in, so there we go. Okay, uh, that's, so that, that, that's really the rationale behind it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Does the pro version of Colab offer any security features, or is that just more hardware in the back end? Yeah, the, the pro version of Colab just means that you get longer time with GPUs and TPUs and all of those kind of things. Um, if you, I use the pro version myself, you know, so if you're spending a lot of time and if you've got lots of Colabs open and all that kind of thing, it, it's worth its weight in gold. Uh, but when it comes to, I mean, Colab is end user optimized as opposed to infrastructure for running an exam optimized, you know, and it wouldn't be fair to ask the Colab folks to build that for us and then take development cycles away from optimizing for the end user. Uh, so we, we had to go the PyCharm route. Uh, just an interesting little anecdote was uh, there was a project uh, built for Tokyo University um, using Colab where they actually wrote like a ton of code um, that runs on the back end and they've open sourced it with the whole point of being able to use Colab to run exams and to do assessments and exams. Uh, the like I said, the, the source is out there somewhere. I can find it and like send it to the group or something like that. It was one of the things that we did evaluate when we were doing this, but it just wasn't ready um, at the level of scale that we'd need to be able to run a global exam. When it was run in a university, it's run for like 50 students, but we needed to be able to scale it to be able to run with thousands uh, of folks, and it just wasn't there yet. But if that does change in the future and become scalable, then we might migrate to something like that. Great. Uh, Mark, you had a question. If you don't mind, I'm muting yourself. I'll make sure you. I, I talked this up. I was just wondering about the um, demand. So, if I handed you three million TensorFlow developers, would would there be enough problems for them? Um, it's it's multi-part. So, it's, uh, <laughs> or is and, and I guess more. I guess the bigger question is, do you know of a, of a way of a framework that's kind of like Kaggle? That where you can easily connect, you know, suppose somebody gives you 3 million developers, how do you connect them to problems that TensorFlow is good for solving? Okay, great question. Uh, so first of all, if you handed me 3 million developers, you'd be my new best friend because I could retire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, so to, to answer the question, um, it's a really tough one because if that kind of framework existed, then that would be kind of dominated by whatever vendor created that framework. And in some ways, we really wanted to be organic growth based on needs that are out there. Uh, one of the nice things that being Google is that 
we index the web uh, and you know we, we our business started with this search engine called google uh, so we got a lot of intelligence about trends we got a lot of intelligence about things that people are looking for etc cetera, etc cetera. and um, one of the things that we saw as an emerging trend that we hope to nip in the bud was that there's a huge demand for people um, to be able to work as ml engineers in companies but a lot of companies that don't already have ML engineering expertise don't know how to find them. And we saw things like along the lines of like interview questions and like what kind of interview questions people ask when they're looking for an ML engineer. And it could be a kid like who's straight out of college and a, a, an interviewer would then ask them, you know, tell me how does the Atom Optimizer work? With the interviewer not even knowing what the Atom Optimizer is, but they looked up that question somewhere online. And it's like you have the wrong questions looking for the wrong skills will eventually bring in the wrong people and the whole house of cards can fall down. And uh, so that was like one of the things that we said, okay, let's take a look at the things that people are doing. And, and that's what I was saying. It was like we saw those three main areas that people were actually actively coding in. And that was computer vision, natural language processing, and sequence modeling in particular. And so we wanted to build our material around that, build a certificate around that, and now a little bit of an answer to your question is like with the certificate program, we now have that network of people who have that certificate. And if you go to tensorflow.org slash certificate, you can go and you can see like, these are the people in your country or these are the people around the world who've passed the certificate exam. And what we're seeing then is an uptick in even them being used as consultants by companies that like, you know, hey, I'm a company, I build an app that does whatever. You know, I think machine learning can help me. How would it work? What kind of skills do I need? Who do I hire? And then it would start growing organically. Um, and that, that's really the, the vision that I've had for it. Um, time will tell if it works or not. And, and I guess, we'll, yeah, so that, that's really the whole idea of where it is. So if you gave me those 3 million people, I'd make them all take the exam. <laughs> and if they pass the exam, then we'd have them all on that website. And then we'll see what, we'll see what happens. I think we've just passed like 600 people on that website. So it is growing. Awesome. Uh, one question that uh, Briaf had was, how do you see AI and software development evolving? Do you see AI coming more and more into the software development territory and maybe eventually <laughs> taking more of the bread and butter of uh, software developers? Or is it more of a, like a symbiotic relationship where they both complement each other? Yeah, I mean, I, it's a great question. And that's really part of the vision that I'm trying to drive would be that AI development should be a part of software development. And if we succeed in this, that, you know, building ML models as a software developer would be the same as writing SQL as a software developer or um, managing remote deployments as a software developer. There's all these skills that are ancillary to just writing code mm -hmm. and that we that have naturally become part of a coder's job. And I'm hoping that building models uh, would be just as natural a part of a coder's job as building user interfaces or, you know, those kind of things. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. I want to respect your time and I want to actually move on to the next part of our uh, presentation here. But what that is, is basically an overview of the TensorFlow in practice specialization with some extra slides that we found interesting that uh, either were not fully covered in this specialization or we wish they were, they were covered in more in detail. So uh, this is more just sort of feedback from our community to you, Lawrence. So sure. the first Great. course, yeah, absolutely. So the first course covered um, the basics of AI, machine learning and deep learning, uh, some introduction on computer vision and uh, using real world images. Um, what, we, what we found interesting is using the very basic model of only one neuron and trying to fit uh, a curve uh, through uh, a line through uh, different data points of, of two uh, X and Y's list that that, that, that ability to actually look at the, the weights as you train your model and, and as you're trying to fit it, uh, we found that really interesting and uh, we went through that in detail in, in, in our very first few sessions. As someone who enjoys uh, playing with models and working through them by hand to uh, before I trust the computer, I, I love this example. Yeah. Oh, good, good. This was a line example. And I I've been amazed at how popular this example has been um, because it's just so simple. Um, and I, I, I like to, and also it's great because earlier I mentioned like being engagement with live coding. This is one that I like to live code because it's so easy <laughs> instead of trying to build something more complex. But yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah. 
And another one is um, early on we tried using TensorBoard in Colab. I know it's not the easiest integration, uh, but uh, the UI of it and the level of information that you get is just just great. Uh, have you ever thought of maybe uh, covering a little bit about TensorBoard? And I know some of us had some issues, especially me, uh, setting it up on, on Colab. Uh, um, is that maybe you think something extra or something that people can look on their own, or is it related to the content that you develop? Yeah, we actually uh, cover it in the data and deployment specialization. We have a week uh, on TensorBoard and on uh, TensorBoard.dev. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with TensorBoard.dev, but the idea behind that is like so that you can share the results of your experiments with other people. Um, so you can like uh, post it to TensorBoard.dev and then you can say, hey, look, this is my epoch accuracy. And instead of taking a screenshot and putting it on a slide, you can actually have that unique URL to, to your one and stuff like that. So one of the weeks in one of the courses on data and deployment is around that for TensorBoard. Great. Awesome. I look forward to checking it out. Great. Uh, course two, uh, covered convolution your networks. David, do you want to lead us with this? Yeah, so, so we looked at a, a much larger data set, uh, something that you couldn't normally just have in memory. So how would you handle some of that? We also uh, looked at ways of avoiding overfitting and explored augmentation as one of the, the crucial ways to, to, to attack that. Uh, week three, we looked at tr the concept of transfer learning because Often neural networks take a long time to train, so you want to take advantage of someone else who's already done that by using the weights and the model they've developed. And then, of course, we looked at something that did more than just do a binary classification. Uh, we looked at the multi-class classifications. And we, we were interested in, uh, we added a little extra content when we were talking about the transfer learning. So we had, we had discussed you know, a lot of the different models out there for CNNs base models and how large they were and just how accurate they were and you know what you got for using all that size. So the, some extra discussions we, we went over. Um, we looked at some of the other techniques for uh, over, you know, controlling overfitting. Uh, we looked at like L2 and regularization approaches. Uh, we pulled in some of uh, content from Andrew's class to just to explore this just a little more. Um, L1 and L2 stuff. So, and uh, we actually graphed out some of the look some of the graphs to see the effect and if we could correct the overfitting between the validation set and the training sets. Cool. Yeah. And one more thing we looked at was batch normalization again as an approach for for handling some of the problems. Again, this is. based off of what we were studying in, in the TensorFlow in practice, so. Mm. Oh, great stuff. And yeah, this is exactly uh, the perfect enhancement to it. Um, yeah. You know, for overfitting, we spoke a lot about augmentation. We didn't really want to go into a lot of the math, um, but if you really want to take your augmentation, oh, sorry, if you want to take fixing your overfitting to the next level, it's exactly what you're doing here. So this yeah. is great. And we looked at a study on the Higgs data set where they were applying different approaches to uh, correcting the overfitting. And that was just a concrete example. You know, wasn't just looking at theory, but actually looking at results. Yeah. Very cool. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, Robert? Or is it me? I think it's me. Great. <laughs> yeah, course three, we talked about natural language processing in TensorFlow. Uh, we talked about sentiment in text and how do you detect sentiment? How do, how do, you, send, how do you do sentiment analysis? We talked about word embeddings and how do we go from words to numerical representations of words, but in a way that relationships and meanings are somehow, somehow preserved when you do this kind of mapping. Then we talked about one of our favorite topics, sequence models and recurrent neural networks and that there are different variations, LSTM, GRUs, and there's so many uh, variations of them. And also, how do you actually generate content uh, after you train it on your own model? So we really like your uh, Irish songs, Lawrence, in your example, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> examples you shared with us. Um, some other things that, um, that we, we had covered in, in Andrew's specialization was actually generating not just text, but maybe like uh, music notes. 
Uh, we, 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 we covered that a little bit of how you actually use an RNA to train it on maybe a jazz and maybe opera and maybe some kind of a mixture of both. I don't know if you're brave enough to, to hear what that sounds like. <laughs> um, another thing was um, talking about how does bias in our data and societal bias affect the models and the results of our models. So um, maybe that's something that um, you can think about or maybe uh, cover sometime in the future because especially now you know whatever's going on in the world it's it's very useful and interesting to us to see and make sure that the data uh, is representative and also the models are not biased in any way um, we found that interesting topic another one is um, how do you combine um, sequence models with computer vision so um, when you usually learn sequence models you just talk about RNAs and, and LSTMs and usually talk at talk from an NLP perspective but that doesn't have to be the case. You can actually run an image through a, a convolutional neural network. You can take uh, a feature out of it. You can take a representation out of it. You can feed a, a neural network so that you can generate captions out of an image. That was an interesting combination of both fields, I, we thought. And the, the latest one is uh, attention mechanism. Um, it's a very useful mechanism that allows uh, your model to, um, to pay attention to different parts of the input and one example in Andrew's specialization was converting uh, raw uh, uh, date formats, for example, Tuesday, 10 July 2007, to machine-readable formats like year, month, day. And you can see this alignment here that when you do this mapping, uh, the months uh, align together, the days align together, and the years align together so that you, are, you have some kind of visibility or uh, into what your, your model is doing, so some kind of explainability, which is pretty hard to do in deep learning these days. Great, another topic that we found interesting is um, how do you actually use uh, structured data in deep learning? Usually when you're deep learning, uh, you're talking about images or text or uh, something else, but you actually can use it for structured data. So in TensorFlow tutorial, there is a structured data set for a classical example of predicting miles per gallon for uh, different uh, car models. And you have different features like cylinders, displacement, horsepower, and, and all that. And you can actually train a very simple DNN to, um, to predict what is the mile per gallon for, for, different, uh, uh, for different examples of for different cars, basically. Uh, Lawrence, are you still there? You seem frozen. Does, does that work well, by the way, the uh, deep learning for structured data? Does it overfit? Uh, not a lot. So if you look at the training and the validation set, they're not that far uh, from each other. But this was just a very basic DNN. Um, I want to make sure that Lawrence is still with us. Okay, I'm going to give Lawrence a few more minutes. Maybe he can join again. So I will comment, typically um, random forest techniques, tree, tree techniques are, are really good for uh, structured data, but there's uh, several new approaches with deep, you know, with uh, deep learning models that are doing comparable or better on some data sets now. Can you share some links out, uh, David, sometime? Because I've been struggling with that and I've typically got GBMs out doing the TNN. So if you can share some of those links, that would be great. Sure. So usually when you do that, you do a deep learning on the side on one side and you do a classical machine learning on the other side and then you combine the output like an ensemble model. David? No, it's just getting better results with the GBMs over DNA. Oh, okay. Lawrence is back, so really yeah, hey, sorry about that. My power went out, so I had to wait for my router to reboot. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Um uh, I want to make sure you, what was the last part you heard? Uh, you were just beginning uh, the sequence models. Okay, perfect. Yes, yeah, so that was our, one of our favorite topics. And um, that we talked about the fact that you, don't, you can use sequence models not only to generate text, but also maybe music. So if you want to 
combine some kind of different styles of music, maybe like jazz or classical music, uh, you can you can train a recurrent neural network to actually generate uh, new uh, styles. And the other thing we talked about is uh, bias, societal bias in in data. How do we make sure that uh, a you you recognize that there's bias in the data, but also there's bias in the decisions that uh, an AI model can make, and how do you how do you compensate for that? And when we talked about uh, sequence models, uh, the input doesn't have to be text. You can actually uh, give an input an image. You can pass it through a convolutional neural network. You can get a high-level representation of that image. And you can feed that through a recurrent neural network to basically generate captions out of an image. So that combination of computer vision and, and NLP was an interesting setup. And the other example of oh, and the other example yeah, about was the, the attention model, uh, the attention mechanism. Keras actually has a layer on, on attention. Uh, it's, a, it's a direction towards explain, explainability in deep learning, which is uh, kind of hard in my personal opinion, but uh, we talked a little bit about this example that we covered in Andrew's uh, specialization of converting a road date format, for example, like Tuesday, July 10th, 2007, to machine-friendly machine uh, date format. And, you'd see how the, the input, which is the x-axis and the output align based on the month or the year and the day. And the other thing that um, uh, we found interesting uh, was there's a tutorial on, on TensorFlow's page where you can actually use structured data for, for deep learning. Uh, structured data and deep learning might not be the first thing you might think of. Uh, it's a good combination, but actually uh, there's an example here that uses this um, miles per gallon data set where you can predict what is the efficiency of a car based on different features using just a simple DNN. Great. And course four, uh, Robert? Sure, so course four was the one on the sequences. And the first week of course four is really just uh, some data wrangling, getting your time series in order. Uh, setting it up so that TensorFlow can ingest it. And we ran a couple of simple models, but uh, mostly just differencing and other things, not actually applying neural networks during week one. Week two, the course goes into deep neural networks. So it's a couple of dense layers for time series using the last, the last 20, a window of 20, 20 values, 50 values, something like that. Uh, then week three, you get into using uh, sequence models for time series, which is which is a natural application of sequence models. We look at uh, vanilla RNNs as well as LSTMs. And then week four, uh, you get to apply that to a real world data set from Sunspots. And I'll just briefly mention, Lawrence gave a a really interesting, uh, I think several places talked about a way that you could optimize the uh, learning rate that you're using in your model. And uh, we tried to reproduce a lot of that and kind of experiment with it. And one of the most important things that we discovered is that if you're gonna do that, you need to have very consistent results between your runs. And for some of that, it was important to uh, set the seeds that we're using for our pseudo random uh, number generators in a couple of places. And, and these, these settings seem to work. The seed obviously could be any, any integer here, but uh, these seem to help us in, in our collab environment to get everything to be consistent. Um, so I was also uh, trying to be a little sneaky uh, with that one where, um, you know, callbacks are something that developers commonly use uh, in software development, but it may not be as familiar a technique for non-software developers. And I just find that callbacks are so, so powerful, um, where like a, a lot of researchers, for example, that I work with, they'll build a model and they'll run it for one epoch and they'll test some stuff and then they'll build it and they'll run it for one epoch and they'll, they'll test some stuff and those kind of things. But I really wanted to kind of get callbacks to be a part of everybody's toolbox and show that it's not just for printing pretty pictures on the end of every epoch, that you can even do things like uh, hyperparameter tuning. Uh, within an epoch using the, uh, in this case, the, the reduce L or on plateau callback, you know, that kind of thing. So it was like, you know, just again, trying to get some of the things that developers are familiar with to do more advanced stuff. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and here we were just looking at some of the results we were getting. Um, 
and I, I won't go into much too much detail, but we 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 went into a lot of detail about how we produce these and and uh, everything. So great, cool. Uh, let's see. This was one of the uh, week three models, I think. Uh, so one thing that I found really interesting with this particular one was the uh, the fact that because you had a trend and you were going up, uh, the model was actually uh, systematically under predicting. Right? It was unable to reach that uh, that peak at the top there, um, and and even throughout on the flat area to the right of this curve, you see that it's pretty much under predicting the entire line. So uh, we were interested in this and and thought we'd do a little bit of a deep deep dive into that. Um, I guess the other thing on this slide is is just really uh, an error that we found in the course with uh, where the learning rate that was used was actually not at the bottom so that that would explain some of the uh, mm. some of the results um, mm. but that was uh, but that was just another thing that we encountered while going through that I yeah. see so 5e to the minus 5 is the red line that you drew rather correct than Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think the uh, the idea was that you wanted a learning rate between e to the minus six and e to the minus five, um, but the one that was used was five e to the minus five. Got it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Whoops. <laughs> I'm a terrible mathematician, obviously. <laughs> so well, then we played with the uh, reducing the learning rate down into the uh, mm. the lower region there, and it helped a little bit, but not a ton, which is what really. Uh, it, Spurred, spurred us to look into uh, you know, some other ways of trying to address like why is this function plateauing? Yeah, and then another type I think I found was when you talk about the different models and different MAE, you, you, you say that the MAE went down, but actually went up. So I don't know, maybe that's a disconnect of the slide of what you're saying. Um, and I, we have links here for both, both of them. Okay, yeah, I'd like to take a look at that. So yeah, I guess this was with the two different learning rates, um, with the original one and the uh, corrected one. And one thing that I found uh, that I sometimes find difficult is visualizing the uh, the errors. And in particular, if you do a visualization like the one on the top, sometimes it can look like your fit is better than it is, right? Because your eyes kind of play tricks on you and it's an optical illusion, like the lines look really close to each other, even though one is going up. Um, you know, while the other one has is still low. So mm. uh, another way of visualizing that is to, uh, or any regression problem really, is just to look at the observed versus the predicted as a scatter plot, uh, which kind of takes out the time step information, but does give you some hint of uh, how your model is behaving. And in this particular case, uh, you know, that plateau becomes really obvious in this plot, mm. where it, the model is just incapable of predicting a value uh, greater than 82 ish there and maybe on the with the other learning rate it got up to about 90 but it's still it's still kind of stuck there and it's unable to form a regression that really extrapolates off the data that it was trained on so I mean when you think about it neural networks are often not designed to extrapolate so this wasn't too surprising so uh, we thought about you know what could one do to uh, try to extrapolate knowing that that's the goal here <laughs> Uh, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. So just looking into it, it turns out that the simple RNN network, the default activation is a tanch. And so if you think about it, what's going to happen during training is that the neurons, it's going to try to take advantage of the curvature in this activation function as much as it can. So at some point, you're going to have large values being fed in, and it's going to peg those close to one. And it's some other values, you're going to have small values fed in, it's going to peg those close to minus one. But then if you try to uh, feed in data that are more extreme than anything it was trained on, it's probably just going to go further out on those flat regions. Uh, and mm -hmm. so the actual network is going to come back and predict whatever the extremum was for the training set, most likely. Mm -hmm. That was our hypothesis anyway. So I thought, mm -hmm. well, why not test that against some other activation functions? So uh, this is just a plot with a few different choices for activation function. The original one that we used in the course was Tanch. Um, I tried a ReLU, a leaky ReLU, and then just a linear function without any 
uh, nonlinear activation at all. And uh, it turns out that the, the intuition there actually did make sense, that if you throw in a linear or a leaky ReLU, uh, it does tend to uh, be a little bit less limited by its inability to extrapolate. So I thought that was kind of a cool deep dive into, uh, into this problem. Yeah, that's great. I wish I chatted with you before I published it. Because <laughs> yeah, that, that one was, a, I, I was struggling with a lot because uh, I wanted to get like, I wanted it to be as real world as possible that says like, hey, look, these are never going to fit perfectly. You're going to have some issues. Mm -hmm. And then to start kind of diving into some coding techniques that will help you minimize those issues. But um, it certainly would have been better for me to look into the, the linear and leaky ReLU as you did here. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was um, really kind of broaden the data that I'm using to train the model. Because if this is part of a synthetic sequence and the synthetic sequence has a lot of these repeated kind of you know, attack, decay, sustain, release, almost like sound waves. And it's like if I had increased my window of the training data and had the window to kind of be, for want of a better term, in rhythm with this prediction window, um, then I think the results would have been better. But then I started getting into training on massive amounts of data. It was taking way too long. And I didn't want students like sitting with Colab for 12 hours to, to get it to go through these. But um, I do like the analysis that you've done here. And uh, I should, um, uh, if I, when I do a future version of the course, I'd love to incorporate this. Sure. Uh, so the other thing that, the other observation though with that is that when you think about it, neural networks are often used on, well, real world data, you don't necessarily want to extrapolate, right? That can be a very dangerous thing to do when you're mm -hmm. predicting on real data. So, you know, perhaps it makes sense for these things to be default, not extrapolating. But for this particular toy problem, since we know we want to extrapolate, it, it made sense to try these uh, yeah. other activations. And let's see, this visualization was really just showing that even after the 400 epochs, we're still, uh, we, we could still have stood to train a little bit longer, all of, mm -hmm. all of these different activation functions. It looked like the uh, metrics were improving still. Yeah, very cool. Great. And the other, the other thing I wanted to add, Robert, was that we started, Lawrence, you started with classical statistical methods, and then you were slowly, slowly building the PNN RNNs. Uh, we see online, especially in competitions for forecasting, a lot of people use some kind of combination of statistical approach and deep learning approach. Uh, I'd be interesting to see how both of those approaches combine in, 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 in maybe in like an you know, ensemble model would maybe give you a better result than just a classical one versus a deep learning. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, one of the hardest things with this course was getting real data that we could work with, um, which is, uh, and getting real reasonable data that could be used as a learning tool, which is why we went with the synthetic data to begin with. And then the, uh, the other part of it is like, okay, once we have the synthetic data and we want to start predicting based off of this, was that a challenge that people will always face is that with a lot of real world data, you know, statistical analysis is so advanced and it's such a, a it's a much older art uh, with so much and so many more years and uh, geniuses behind it uh, that we wanted to kind of not make it an either or thing. But it's like, hey, if you learn statistics and you know statistics and you're good at statistics, then you may never even need to touch a DNN model. But then if you're hitting up against the wall of statistics, then uh, being able to hit uh, being able to use a DNN model might help. And what I found, like when I've chatted with a lot of folks, particularly mathematicians who've taken the course, is that they end up having this kind of virtuous cycle where they start like hacking away with it statistically and then they build a DNN or an RNN to be able to do something and then they learn something from that and then they go back to statistical methods to continually refine and improve their model. I thought that was awesome. That's interesting. Great. Those were the, the slides that we wanted to share with you and some of the discussion points we wanted to, to chat with you. Um, I am, we, we want to respect your time. I know that you're, you're a busy person, so we really want to appreciate you, appreciate you being here. And if you have any questions or feedback for us, uh, now would be a great time, Lawrence. Sure, well, well, first of all, I want to thank you uh, for everything and for running this. It's just amazing. And for all of this feedback, um, certainly I can use a lot of the things that you've learned here to make the course better. 
um, as we improve it. You know, I'll probably do a new version of this for TensorFlow 3 or something along those lines, if and when that ever happens. Um, but I also like, you know, just want to thank everybody who's kind of tuned in today. Um, there were a bunch of questions that I haven't yet answered that I'd like to spend the time to answer. However, uh, when my power went out, I lost what was in the chat window. <laughs> so uh, if, if anybody around like still has like any questions like that, I'd love to be, I can, I'm happy to spend a few more minutes if you're okay there's, to answer any of there those There is a questions. great one here on the AI winter. Uh, yes. From Quantiversity, uh, Quant Quantiversity Administrator, can you please comment on the AI winter you mentioned and speak to your confidence that it will not likely happen again? You seem to have implied that having enough developers would be sufficient to control for this. Okay, great question. So, I mean, I'll talk a little bit. My personal experience with the AI winter was um, I first started doing AI in 1992. And um, I was in the UK and I was unemployed. And the British government actually started a, um, a program where they wanted to get some of the best uh, computer scientists together or programmers and developers and that together and to have them kind of create this nucleus that might be a group of people that can help British industry in AI going forward. And that was in 1992. And uh, unfortunately, the thing failed completely. And, um, the, and the reason for it was that AI at the time, there were a lot of research papers, there was a lot of good stuff going out there. But when it came to programming, you had a language called Lisp um, for NLP, and you had a language called Prolog for like basic log logical inference but none of them were really useful for building any kind of applications. Microsoft Windows was taking over the world by then and you just couldn't build any Windows applications. And as a result, you couldn't get AI into people's hands. And it's my opinion that that was one of the things that contributed to an overall AI winter because you can have all great papers being published and research being done and PhDs being granted, but until it's something that people are actually using and able to use easily, um, and like so many developers can build applications around it, then it just really wouldn't penetrate the world. So now with uh, the last four or five years, with the advent of big data, with the advent of like uh, much more processing power, new frameworks and new techniques, it feels like history could repeat itself. And so part of my mission and part of what I'm trying to drive is like, you know, if you have three million software developers building apps and those apps build up a whole new type of industry like around computer vision or activity detection or natural language processing, to the extent that the AI stuff becomes a natural part of any developer's toolbox, then that history would not repeat. And, and then that history of an AI winter, of course, wouldn't repeat either. So that was really what I was driving at there. Um, uh, in my career, there have been like three great revolutions in technology and new scenarios came out as a result of them. The first one was um, the web and, you know, moving to distributed computing with the web. The second one then was mobile. And, you know, when Steve Jobs came on stage and said one more thing and uh, released the iPhone in 2007, that started up a whole new industry of mobile developers and a whole new scenarios because now people have like a little black rectangle in their pocket that has internet connectivity, has sensors, has GPS, has camera, and applications that never would have existed before that became commonplace and became multi-billion dollar industries. And then the third one I think is with AI and machine learning. And um, until you can have the Uber of AI or the Instagram of AI or the Microsoft Windows of AI or the browser of AI becoming that kind of common thing the way it did with those two previous revolutions, then then another AI winter I think could happen. Um, and the key to that is more developers building more unique and innovative applications. Great. Uh, Ryan has a question. Why is Google so interested in motivating and promoting the field of AI, even if it's not for profits? Um, I, I think it's not for, do <laughs> sorry? I wasn't brave enough to ask that, Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, you can ask me anything. I may not answer everything, but you can ask me anything. Uh, the, uh, I think, it's not for direct profits, but I think everybody can profit, including us, uh, by opening up whole new scenarios. Um, you know, if, if whole new scenarios of new application classes come out, things that we've never even thought of or heard of before because of AI, a lot of them are gonna run on Android. A lot of them might use Google services like Google Maps or Cloud or anything like that. So it's, you know, as the industry advances and as the industry grows, and as new businesses grow, you know, a, a not zero slice of them will be using Google services. And as a result, you know, we could profit from them that way. 
Um, like, you know, nobody ever dreamed that um, you know, in 2004 or 2005, that Apple would be a trillion dollar company off of apps. And, uh, but then like they brought out this app platform, this mobile app platform, and they have an app store and as people buy apps and, you know, nobody ever dreamed that it could be that way. And I think the same kind of thing can repeat itself. And companies such as us or Apple or Microsoft, or even that small startup that we haven't heard of yet um, could all become very profitable as a result. Uh, Frederick asked, what really cool problems does AI solve that ordinary people uh, get the fact that it's cool and useful? Um, one of my personal favorites, and I usually use it, um, is uh, if you go to youtube.com slash tensorflow, there's a video on there about a plant called cassava. And um, the idea behind the, this application was that um, in Tanzania in Africa, and obviously in many other countries, but I'm going to go to Tanzania in particular, um, many farmers um, grow crops as cash crops. Oh, there it is. And uh, they grow crops as cash crops. Um, and so they sell those cash crops so that they can pay their rent and send their kids to school and those kind of things where cash crops fail. And if cash crops fail, you don't want to starve. So they, many of them have a backup crop and the backup crop is cassava. And so, you know, cassava is something they, they can sell it, of course, as well. But as the backup, they have it as something that they can eat. Now, cassava, one of the things I learned about it is that once a cassava plant has blight, um, you know, it, it basically not just that plant, but every plant within a very large radius is just is useless. Um, but you can't detect blight until it's too late with the human eye. And so we worked with some folks in uh, Carnegie Mellon, Uni Mellon University, I think it was, and some folks in Tanzania to build this app. Now, this is in Tanzania, so they don't exactly have 4G or 5G connectivity. Uh, so the idea is that this app had to run entirely on a phone, and um, so it was trained on leaves. But one of the nice things was that uh, the leaves were classified in various states of disease, and it was able to spot, you know, so for example, I look at the leaf today, and I tag it today, and I look at it tomorrow, and I tag it tomorrow, and I look at it the next day and tag it, and create my training data that way. But then this one particular leaf, I don't know until three weeks from now that it gets blight. But from today's training data where I can't see the blight, I can train it off of that. And as a result, this app was able to spot blight in the leaves before a human eye could. It would run entirely on a cheap Android device and it would run, like I said, entirely on device without any connectivity. So um, now it's a case of farmers can just take a photograph of their leaf or look at a live preview like that and see if the plant is blighted or not. So they can rip that plant out and they can look at the surrounding ones rather than waiting for the blight to actually show itself and lose the entire crop. So that was the one that kind of you know, still wows me to this day. There's quite a few of them out there, but I think you know, that's a cool problem I think AI has solved that you could not write if then code to do this. You have to do computer vision and machine learning to do it. Yep, that was an example that yeah, touched this as well. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thanks. I think Christina has one more question regarding applications of AI in the energy sector. Uh, are there any? Um, I know Google Cloud is um, not AI to self uh, monitor their uh, electricity usage, right, and their cooling system. Yeah, um, that that's one. So outside energy sector, that kind of thing, I, I don't really know of any. Sorry, but yes, exactly. So a lot of our internal systems in Google, we like to optimize uh, using AI. So for example, uh, all of our cloud data centers, we want their carbon footprint to be as low as possible. So there's a lot of machine learning actually used within them to prevent you know, uh, waste of power and keep our carbon footprint down. And one that I actually always like to use, it's related to that, but it's not quite energy. So sorry, Christina, I'm gonna deflect away from the question to, to this other one. But when I first joined Google, um, one of the things that I learned was um, we're famous for having free food. At least when offices are open, there's no free food right now, but we're famous for having free food um, in many of our offices. And one of the things we're very concerned about was wastage of that food. And from a very early, um, from a very early stage, even before TensorFlow was released, that was one of the things where we applied machine learning. Um, so that to kind of look at how much food we produce in each cafe. Um, so that you know people don't waste food and we don't cook stuff and it's left lying in the buffet and nobody eats it and those kind of things and we've actually gotten really 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 good at that uh, to the extent that our wastage is like 
it's minimal. And uh, so I, I thought that's really cool. And I keep saying we should sell that as a service to anybody that provides buffets. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. One so Martin asks, question. Yeah, uh, can TF program reinforcement learning applications? Yes, um, there is a framework in TensorFlow called TF Agents, um, which is really designed entirely around reinforcement learning applications. I'll be completely honest with you, I haven't fully gotten my arms around TF Agents yet. It's pretty complex, uh, but I've seen some of the stuff that people have built with it and all, all entirely around uh, reinforcement learning. And it's one of the things on my to-do list to try and build up some expertise in it. But yeah, just look up TF Agents. Uh, Ryan asks, is there a publicly available model for that one? The cafe use case? Not yet, but I really want us to have one. <laughs> and uh, it, it was actually built, we had an internal framework inside Google called Distill. And it was built in that and distill then evolved into TensorFlow. And I don't think anybody ever updated it to TensorFlow, but I should check into that. Awesome. OK, so there are no more questions. Again, I want to thank you, Lawrence. This has been a great experience. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. Uh, we learned a lot. And uh, the last slide I had was regarding our next session, which is next week. And uh, we'll be covering a little bit about, we'll be talking a little bit about the, uh, the developer exam. We'll be talking a little bit about the setup, the, the PyCharm setup that we talked about, uh, how to best prepare for it, and how can you use the TensorFlow and practice specialization to actually prepare and pass this exam. Yep, we're, we're very passionate about the exam, so please, uh, yeah, any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, one of the things that we are encouraging is like, uh, we do want to widen access to everybody. Uh, so we do have some stipends uh, for the exam that if somebody's unemployed, for example, and lots of people are at the moment, that you know we can reduce the price of the exam. We can also offer free access to the course material to help you prepare for the exam and stuff like that. So any questions around that, please feel free to reach out. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Great. Thank you. Well, thanks again, Lawrence. We really appreciate it. Uh, we hope to see you again sometime in the future. It's been really grateful. And thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. We'd love to. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Have a great night and happy 4th of July for tomorrow. Happy thanks, Lawrence. Thanks, George. Thank you, everyone.